Good morning. This is BBC News. I'm Tom Rolls. On the way. R. Kelly faces life in prison after being found guilty of abusing women and children. Of all the predators that I have pursued, Mr. Kelly is the worst. Plus, most children in England say they would be willing to get a COVID jab and later bonds back. But can he save cinema? First, though, military drivers are being trained up to fix the fuel crisis. The army has been put on standby to help ease pressure on petrol stations and to deliver fuel after days of queues and closures. A shortage of tanker drivers sparked panic buying at four courts across the country. The business secretary has said training up military personnel is a sensible precautionary step. But our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, says it'll take some time. I'm told it will initially be 75 drivers that could go up to 150 with the same number of support staff. But they do need specialised training that can take up to five days so it's not uh, a quick fix if you like. Ministers have again stressed that there is plenty of fuel at refineries and blamed the pumps running dry on people buying fuel when they don't need it. Suppliers say they expect demand to return to normal in the coming days. The UK is estimated to be short of more than 100,000 lorry drivers. Tom Reddy is a driver who's recently handed in his notice. He doesn't think the situation will improve without better hours and conditions. We have been severely let down by our government in this and in recent years in the industry, we, we kind of head in hand so much at the please work longer as if that's any kind of a solution or we'll make the test easier. All the easy solutions is the ones they tend to follow. The government and oil companies have insisted all along that there's been no shortage of fuel. So what's fueled the panic buying? Some suggesting that if people weren't aware that there was a shortage, then there wouldn't have been this issue. For five minutes more on this from the newscast team. Say Alexa, more from BBC News. A court in New York has found the singer R. Kelly guilty of exploiting his superstar status to run a scheme to sexually abuse women, girls and boys over two decades. I have been practicing law for 47 years. During this time, I have pursued many sexual predators who have committed crimes against women and children. Of all the predators that I have pursued, however... Mr. Kelly is the worst. That's attorney Gloria Ulred there. She represented several of the victims who testified at the trial. Along with eight counts of sex trafficking, R. Kelly was also found guilty of racketeering, a charge normally used against organised crime groups. Over five weeks, the court heard how he ran a criminal enterprise that recruited children and women for sex. Jacqueline Kasoulis is the acting attorney general for New York's Eastern District. The jury delivered a powerful message to men like R. Kelly. No matter how long it takes, the long arm of the law will catch up with you. Kelly is due to be sentenced next May. He could spend the rest of his life behind bars. The BBC's Neda Tofik has been speaking to some of those who testified against him. He had been grooming me to become one of his pets. He calls them his pets. For three minutes more on the background to this disturbing case. Say Alexa. From BBC News. A 36-year-old man will appear in court today charged with the murder of Sabina Nessa. The primary school teacher was killed 10 days ago on her way to meet a friend in a pub in South London. Her body was found in a nearby park the next day. Kochi Salamaj was arrested in Eastbourne in East Sussex on Sunday. Ministers in Northern Ireland have agreed to end social distancing restrictions for shops, theatres and a number of other indoor settings from 6pm on Thursday. The measures will remain in place for pubs and restaurants. Here's our Ireland correspondent, Chris Page. The devolved government has said businesses should put in place measures to reduce virus transmission. For example, asking people going to events for proof of vaccination. But this will be advice and not a legal requirement. Most children and teenagers in England would be willing to be vaccinated against COVID-19, according to research by the journal eClinical Medicine. The survey of nearly 28,000 school pupils aged 9 to 18 is the first to ask what children and teenagers, rather than their parents, think about getting the jab. Just over half said they would get the vaccine, 37% said they were undecided, 13% said they would decline the offer. Here's our health correspondent, Catherine DeCosta. 
Those less willing tended to be younger from deprived backgrounds and children who didn't feel part of the school community. The researchers say celebrities and influencers on social media should be used to help target accurate information at young people about the benefits and risks of COVID vaccines. The Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg will be among almost 400 young people from more than 180 countries meeting today in Milan to discuss climate change. The Youth for Climate event comes as research suggests a child born in 2021 will experience seven times as many heat waves during their life as today's adults. The young activists at the event will have the chance to press politicians for more urgent action ahead of the UN Climate Conference COP26 in November. Dani Villafana is a climate activist who started campaigning when she was 14. She says having a voice at summits like this is really important. The reality is that whilst we're already experiencing the impacts of climate change, the most severe impacts are going to be those that affect our future and our lives. And the reality is we're the ones that are going to be delivering these sustainable solutions into the future. It's finally time for No Time to Die. After many months of delays, the latest James Bond film gets its first public screening tonight at London's Royal Albert Hall. It's expected to be Daniel Craig's final outing as 007. The actor has said he hopes the film will give the cinema industry a boost after a year of closures caused by COVID-19 restrictions. Stuart Neal runs the interactive museum Spyscape in New York. There's a lot of pressure on Bond coming out internationally. Uh, I believe it's coming out in the UK first, uh, but to really reignite the the box office, it has the chance to bring movies back to the forefront uh, of entertainment. What more do we know about the longest James Bond film ever made and who might take over from Daniel Craig in the lead role? I would love to see Idris Elba, Timothy Chalamet, or Adam Driver. For five minutes more on No Time to Die. Say Alexa. More from BBC News. Sport now. In football, Brighton scored an injury time equaliser at Selhurst Park to rescue a point against Crystal Palace. Neil Mopé got the goal in the 95th minute after Wilfred Zaha had given Palace the lead from the penalty spot on the stroke of half-time. Attention turns to the Champions League this evening with Manchester City facing Paris Saint-Germain in the French capital and Liverpool travelling to Portugal to take on Porto. UEFA have said disciplinary proceedings against the clubs who founded the failed European Super League have been declared null and void. European football's governing body has also said it will not yet collect the goodwill payments agreed with the nine clubs who withdrew from the proposed project, including the six Premier League sides, Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester City, Manchester United and Tottenham, who'd agreed a combined payment of £22 million in June. In rugby union, scrum half Ben Youngs and centre Ollie Lawrence have withdrawn from England's training camp ahead of the autumn internationals against Tonga, Australia and South Africa. And the four-time Grand Slam winner Naomi Asai Osaka says she will return to tennis soon after getting the itch to play again. Osaka took a break from the sport after the US Open. In boxing, Anthony Joshua suffered a comprehensive defeat at the weekend to Ukraine's Alexander Usyk and the post-mortem continues. He was exposed a little bit. For five minutes more from a former pro on where it all went wrong for AJ. Say Alexa. More from BBC News. Damaging levels of illegal drugs have been found in the river that flows through the site of the Glastonbury Festival. Researchers at Bangor University took samples from White Lake River before, during and after the last time the festival was held in 2019. They discovered levels of cocaine that were high enough to affect the life cycle of European eels, an endangered species. Scientists are now urging festival goers to use the toilets provided by organisers. They say attendees urinating in public could be driving the pollution. That's your latest from the BBC Newsroom. Check back at any time for an update by asking your device to play BBC News. 